Good afternoon. So, uh, it's a very interesting uh, session, uh, which is on, uh, you know, how do you create niche categories? How do you create completely new categories out of the blue? And, uh, you know, sometimes these categories, these product groups are completely unknown to consumers. They wouldn't even know that, you know, there was a need for such a thing. And you create it and then you create a market for it and then you create a followership for it, right? So, so that's very, very interesting and that's what this session is about. It's a huge panel. Uh, I don't think in my, all my experience I've had such a huge panel and if I sit in the center or anywhere, I don't think I'll be able to, uh, you know, view the speakers. So I'll try and stand or I'll use the dais as I go, okay? So uh, maybe, uh, you know, I'll, I'll ask each of you to just say one line about your business and one word that defines product innovation for you. You can start from the end. Uh, hey guys, I'm Udit Toshniwal, the co-founder of The Pant Project. And for us, our business, business is all about custom made. So I would say personalization is the one word behind product innovation. We're always listening to our consumer and reacting for them. Hi everybody, this is uh, Tarun Chabra. I'm one among the founders of Neiman's Shoes. We craft uh, exceptionally comfortable footwear and we do that with some amazing natural and sustainable fibers. So the one word that comes to mind is comfort when you look at Neiman's Shoes. Hi, I'm Amrita Vaswani. I am the founder of Bee Diapers, uh, India's first and only hybrid diaper um, company and the one word that comes to mind uh, that is uh, with my product is uh, uh, India's healthiest diaper. Uh, hi, I'm Apoor. I'm the founder CEO of uh, Gods. Uh, we are an outdoor gear brand and Gods means gear of daring spirit, not the almighty. Uh, so we've created some very innovative products in these categories, hold about 21 patents across India, Europe, US. So one word uh, in which I can define my brand would be remarkable. I'm a very big fan of that word, remarkable. Uh, hi friends, I'm, <coughs> I'm Bupendra. Uh, I'm the founder and CEO of uh, Doxichu. So we actually make dogs happy. So we make uh, the, the natural and uh, organic treats for dogs. Hi everyone, I'm Radhita Agarwal. I'm the co-founder of Chaika. We make instant tea premixes where all you have to do is empty out a, a sachet into a mug and add hot water and you have a cup of masala chai ready. For me, innovation is all about convenience. The one word that comes to my mind is definitely convenience because that's what, um, that's what people are after and that's what we try to provide them. Hi, uh, I'm Dheeraj from Campus Sutra. Campus Sutra is the biggest bootstrap fashion brand in the country. Uh, we are present in about 22 countries apart from India. Uh, we're also the first online first brand to be present in about 500 store in store across lifestyle, shopper, central. Uh, the one word that comes to my mind is identity, right? So Campus Sutra was born with the whole idea of uh, giving a voice to college kids. So, you know, so the one word that I would speak about is identity. Hi, uh, my name is Shomajit. I'm from Stitched. Uh, we are a zero inventory, zero warehouse, uh, zero wastage youth fashion brand uh, present in India and UAE uh, with uh, unlimited assortment of choices and a quarter of the price of any other brand. Uh, one word that comes to my mind is disruption. Uh, hi everyone, I'm Hitesh Rathi, I'm the founder of Advik Foods. Uh, we are India's first brand into uh, unique natural and healthy products. Our flagship uh, range being camel, goat, donkey milk. So we make numerous products out of it. And the one word which uh, comes to my mind, uh, it's unique. That's it. Thanks a lot, thanks. And the mic flowed from that end to this end. Okay, and there are mics uh, at, at all places. Now, I'll, I'll start with this, you know, it's all about unmet need and it's about creating a niche, right? And each of you would have a wonderful story, you know, which triggered 
this idea and this thought and then it formulated into business. Uh, let's pick up three, and I'm, I'm not going to point out who, uh, and I'm sure each of you have interesting stories, but three of you maybe share that inspiration, that moment of, you know, that moment that triggered or ignited this idea and said that, you know, this could be a business, this is something we need to work upon as a mission. And a lot of you, uh, you know, it's not just business, it's, it's a mission, right? So any three of you. So uh, for me, Chaika started when I was studying and then consequentially after that working in Singapore. Um, I'm the sort of person that needs my cup of masala chai the minute I wake up and I, I need it before I can function. And um, it was just that in between, you know, hectic uh, class schedules or even when I was working, um, I was working in as a trader at uh, BNP Paribas, I had to be at office really early. So I just didn't have that kind of time in the morning uh, to brew and make that perfect cup of masala chai. So when I moved back to India, that was the first thing on my mind was that if I have to start something, I have to make, find a way to make uh, masala chai, making masala chai a lot easier. So that was sort of the uh, problem that I was trying to address and um, that was how Chai Ka started out. Uh, so we started Campus Sutra way back in 2014, right? So we were one of the first few brands which entered D2C space when D2C was not a word, uh, right? Uh, for us, the basic hypothesis was that I come from Walmart. So before Campus Sutra, I was in Walmart for about seven years. And uh, uh, in a lot of Western countries, this entire concept of back to school, back to college, uh, love for campus is a very, very big thing. But in, in India, this space was not defined. So you, if you walk into any college, right? Uh, you see a Bob Marley or you see uh, uh, stuff around football and things like that, right? But what is India's college kids love, uh, you know, if you, if you have to define that, it would be cricket. Uh, you would, uh, if you walk into college even now, you'll see Northwestern University, but that's not in India. So Campus Uta was all about creating products that would speak to the, you know, college kid, in, uh, you know, and would, uh, would kind of provide him a scope for expressing himself. So that's how Campus Sutra started. Uh, and then it has been a journey. We started online, uh, then we shifted offline. Uh, shifted as in, this is the wrong word to use, but we kind of you know, diversified offline. And now international, so we are the first fashion brand to be present in 22 countries. Uh, and uh, that's one of the space that we are really, really excited about. So, uh, so for me, uh, it all started, I was working uh, with Adobe Systems as a computer scientist. And I went on these number of road trips, uh, motorcycle road trips with, with my friends where I realized that there is a huge gap between my own expectation as a customer and these products available in the market, whether it was Indian brands or international brands, where I was not even happy with the kind of user experience I was getting. So that's where uh, that entire idea came in and I've been a very big pinch on for design creation and everything since my childhood. And that kind of gave me that Ikigai is what it is called uh, nowadays, that, uh, that kind of an intersection between your passion and what you can actually uh, sell and scale well. So that's where it started. Our first product was a motorcycle saddle bag. I'm not sure, I'm sure at least 90% of you won't be even aware of what a saddle bag is. And that's what the niche was, means it was uh, primarily a product used by hardcore riders for long trips. And the problem with the saddlebag was that there was uh, multiple problems which we solved. Uh, it, it required a certain physics to that. It was not just design. It required engineering mechanics to uh, scale that well. It, it had to have a larger volume because it used to droop down and maybe there were a lot, a lot, lot of accidents because of uh, the saddlebag getting into the wheels and all of that. So we held uh, one granted patent for that in India. And the product was so much successful that uh, after four months of its launch, Royal Enfield acquired it for their own portfolio. So post that, we worked with Royal Enfield for another 10, 11 months or so, designed a lot of products for them. Uh, but then eventually we realized that uh, eventually this is going to be just a design agency for Royal Enfield, although the business was good, money was good, and everything likewise. But uh, then we defocused ourselves, focused back on the brand, and then all of these innovations that we did, we currently hold about 21 patents and all of these uh, products on the marketplaces, our website, and elsewhere. So that's a very gist of what, uh, how we started. 
Yeah, thanks, thanks a lot. And before we go to the next three, I know everybody has stories and keen to share that. Uh, just reflect a bit, you know, so, so what is that trigger? Is it a personal experience? Is it, is it something that's linked to your values, uh, you know, which, which kind of triggers, you know, uh, the spark, right? And the next three, and again, the other, you know, not the ones who spoke, but the next three, if you could just think about what was that ingredient, you know, which really uh, created that need for you to think on the business idea and then, you know, develop it. Again, any three. So, I would like to go first. So, about uh, me, I am otherwise a civil engineer. So, I was working in Myanmar as a construction manager. So, uh, that was the time when, you know, this kind of thought came in, like, what I am doing with my life. Is this the future you want and all? So, and I come from Bikaner. And so, I thought, like, yes, I should, you know, give it a shot. I did my research and everything on camel milk and there were certain things which, you know, you came to know you, when you are actually doing it, you know, when you are actually researching about something, you come to know about so many things. Like, uh, for example, uh, the camel population. So, I know uh, people are not aware of it, but uh, it's on constant decline and people, uh, like, it's near to extinction because of their utility has gone down. So we thought like, you know, this camel milk in itself, it's very unique and it is also a way that you can save that population. So when, whenever this thing Rajasthan comes to your mind, the image of camels just kind of flashes. So that was the moment for me that, you know, this is the way I can, you know, save the population as well and then obviously create a business out of it as well. That was it. Hey. So for us at the PAN project, ironically, the need came about post the pandemic, the first wave, when I think everyone wasn't wearing pants at home the whole season. And then after that, you realized your body shape had changed. You couldn't go to the local tailor anymore and actually stitch your pants because that whole industry had changed. And you wanted something that was really convenient. Um, so we worked through the whole pandemic. And in October 2020, we launched the PAN project. And we also managed to be D2C because uh, retail had changed. So being e-tailers e or digitally centric became really important to our brand. Um, and I think that's been kind of the success. Backing off of our legacy of our family business, but then leveraging that into the direct-to-consumer world really helped us. I think for me, uh, the whole initiation of the thought process of Stitch started with my experience with Jabong. I used to head marketing for Jabong, and uh, we used to get 85% of our orders from the top 8 to 10 cities in India. And whenever we were asked to scale up, right, and, and we used to uh, allocate budgets accordingly. So 85% of the budget would go towards Delhi, Mumbai, Pune, Bangalore, just the usual suspects. Uh, the moment we started spending towards tier two, tier three places, the ROI went for a toss. And we realized that, you know, we say that, okay, we have these many customers, but the real penetration of fashion in tier two to tier six places are almost zero. And the reason is the high uh, ticket size. Fashion is not affordable for most brands. Uh, the reason? 15% of fabric gets wasted during the manufacturing process. 25% of inventory never gets sold. Uh, 25 to 35% RTOs are prevalent in India, which comes back to the warehouse maybe after a month, month and a half, sometimes in damaged conditions, sometimes post the season gets over, which brings us to seasons, right? So there are two seasons of fashion. Uh, there's spring, summer, there's autumn, winter, right? Uh, why are there no seasons launching every week? Right? So, th so these were the initial thought process which uh, you know, initiated the, the, the thinking as to how can we solve some of the business problem to help the customers as to the, the whole warehouse issue, right? B brands work in a way where they create samples, they do large-scale manufacturing, they stock it in warehouse, they start liquidating, giving discounts, end-of-season sale. Can we move from that? Can we create a very patented production on demand, keep it absolutely zero inventory, just in time, and unlimited number of options every day? Uh, onto the website, be more than what Mintra offers at a 1.2 lakh SKU or 1.5 lakh SKU, and go global, uh, targeting the age group of 18 to 25, uh, tier two to tier six places. So, so that was the thought process. Thanks, thanks. So I'll come to some specific people now who haven't spoken. So Amrita, uh, you know, your product is uh, something that is very sensitive, and it needs the mother's trust, you know, to adopt it. So. What was the driver for that? How do you, how do you really convince that segment, you know, uh, which is used to certain kind of products traditionally? Yeah, so um, 
Mine is a hybrid diaper. Uh, it's a diaper that kind of sits in between cloth uh, and disposable. And um, uh, I think the, I, I think the product needs to solve the problem. So I think my journey, I should talk about it, which will actually answer your question, which is back in 2013, I launched uh, India's first cloth diaper, um, the, the modern cloth diaper, which it is right now. And, uh, and I did really well. Um, we, were, we were the number one brand at that time, and revenues were great. But I think that um, I learned that was coming uh, more out of, it was not really solving the need for which I had put the product out. Um, the sales were coming out of uh, cloth diapers being used for cute prints. And, uh, and I also did not see repeat. I did not see mothers coming back. There was still a whole segment of moms that was still using disposables. So I felt like my product at that time wasn't really solving the real problem. And it was still selling because, because it was a good product, which is why, which is when I started the development of the hybrid diaper. And uh, so I think the one word that I believe uh, was choice. I feel every mother requires or needs the choice and shouldn't have to choose between cloth and disposables and shouldn't have to, there should be no guilt in uh, your own convenience which is how the hybrid diaper came about, which is it gives you the convenience of cloth and the, uh, the convenience of disposables and the health of cloth. So um, gaining, the, uh, gaining the mother's trust came out of definitely solving that real problem. So I could have continued to sell cloth diapers, but I never thought that was solving the problem. My product right now was actually solving the two problems a diaper should solve, which is leaks and rashes. So. Yeah, that's been the journey. That's how you, I guess it should, your product, I mean, laser focus in solving a problem is probably the answer to that. So problem solving, uh, uh, linkage to a higher purpose, like some of you said, and real, uh, you know, experience of, uh, or finding the gaps and the lacunae, you know, from your professional experience. I'll come to Tarun. Uh, Tarun stands out, all the boring footwear that we are wearing, look at him. You know, he stands out, right? What, what was the inspiration for creating this? Right, so uh, this was back when I was in the US, right? Uh, I was in New Jersey. Uh, my day used to start at 6 in the morning. I used to wear uh, a boring running shoe, which was very bulky, very flashy, go out for a run. And uh, staying in New Jersey, I was working in Philadelphia downtown, right? So for all you folks who don't know, that's close to a two-hour train ride. And uh, post taking that train ride, uh, I used to again wear my running shoe, run all the way to work. Then I had a couple of formal shoes at my desk, right? Uh, so I had to take out the running shoe because it's so bulky. Of course, being a high-profile consultant, I couldn't wear that. And uh, I never used to enjoy wearing a formal shoe. Post a couple of hours, I used to take it out and, and put on either a slipper or a slide or put my running shoe back on, right? So this continued for, for way too long. And uh, there was a time when I had owned over 200 pairs of shoes, right? And my basement was full of shoes back in New Jersey. Then one travel incident uh, left me wondering as to why don't I do something about the space, right? Uh, and when I started doing a lot of research in India, what I learned was the predominant population looks at comfort as a segment, which is, which is unaddressed. There's quarter percent of people that are looking at running shoes, which are looking at marathon, right? Crossfit, formal, but predominant of our folks look at comfort. Kuch comfortable ho hui chahiye, right? And I said, this is the space to go after. And uh, as and when we started looking at the comfort thesis, right? The comfort market. And when we started digging deeper, we realized the entire materials that go into footwear. And we learned uh, leather, which comes from animal skin. Right? We said, that can't be what you wear on your foot, right? You, you can't be crushing animals. You can't be killing animals to, to create comfortable footwear. So we said, that's a no-no for us. And then we looked at other materials, which are synthetics of the world. They pollute the environment, not create, consume a lot of water, emit a lot of chemicals. So we said, there's got to be a better way to do this. 
and spent about two years and created several India's first. We are the first brand in India to introduce Merino Bull footwear. We are the first brand to collect recycled tires and craft an exceptionally comfortable footwear. We've just started the tire uh, you know, slipper a year ago and today it's organic bestseller on Amazon. We're India's first to introduce a sneaker that's made with recycled plastic bottles. So we've disrupted the way the materials were chosen and the way consumers were served across India, right? And serving a large demographic. We've been around just three years and sold upwards of five million pairs and uh, upwards of 90% of our consumers claim Neiman's to be the most comfortable pair of shoes that they've ever worn, right? So the thesis is a very strong community, beautiful products driven by very strong passion and also looking at comfort and sustainability as a market, right? That's what Neiman stands for today. So what struck me across uh, the narratives was you start solving one problem and you end up solving multiple problems, right? Through, through that initiative. So that's, that's really interesting. I'll come to Bhupendra. Uh, you deal with a category, but all your brand communication is that you love dogs. It is not about the product at all. So uh, what do you stand for? How did it come about? There are global and Indian brands which are established. So where did you find that niche and the differentiation? So it uh, all goes back to uh, 2015 where I was actually running a software company and then like I came out uh, and then I had to do something after that, uh, uh, right? So, uh, so during, during that uh, phase, a few very interesting, uh, interesting things ha <clears throat> happened. The first thing was I found I have only two passions in life, right? Uh, the first was, first was analytics, which is the company I was running, and the second uh, uh, was food. So I had to do something in food, and me and my wife, uh, like, uh, she's here. So we started discussing, like, uh, what to do next, and, uh, uh, and then one idea came. Right, so people, everybody know about North Indian and South Indian food, but nobody knows about uh, the East Indian food. So why don't we create an East Indian uh, food brand, right? So with that thought, we started, we actually went uh, to the Himalayan region, mostly North, uh, Northeast, uh, Sikkim, Darjeeling, Nepal, all those areas and exploring products. And this very interesting uh, product, this yak milk uh, treat, like we, we bumped into with, uh, uh, in one of the dairies in Darjeeling. And, and they were saying, like, the dogs steal that, right? And this is a, a very commonly eaten uh, uh, product, which is extremely hardly smoked dried cheese. And uh, I grew up uh, eating that. And when people were saying dogs steal it, we as pet parents, uh, we, it hit us in a different way, right? We thought uh, maybe this is a good product to take. And, and at that point of time, both of us in different companies, right, we were solving a lot of large companies' problems. Uh, and, uh, uh, and then, like, uh, like, we were, like, thinking, like, this product is made from yak milk, uh, product of Himalayas, 100% uh, natural, gluten-free, grain-free, anything that the industry or the people or look, customers are looking at, we just had that in the product, right? So, uh, so we actually did some research and ultimately, you know, we changed our entire business plan and we thought, okay, let's do dogs first. And when we were like launching this, right? So, uh, so the history, like the way we started this company only became like that, right? It all came out for the love of dogs. We love dogs and they steal it. So there one problem is solved and then it is extremely hard. So it has a dental benefit. So there are a lot of, lot of things. But above all, you know, in all, uh, what we realized is uh, there were a lot of products. As you mentioned, there are a lot of brands, a lot of products already there, there in the market. But there was one huge gap that no one was addressing. Right? Those products were made for dog owners. Right? So what we felt is there has to be something for the dog parents. Right? It has to, the product or the brand has to represent uh, the people's love for the dogs. So, uh, so we build a net and whatever we do, we just try to come up with that particular passion again and again, uh, like, like uh, in, uh, 
uh, in our all the communications uh, is we want to give uh, our pet the product that we would ideally give it to our kids. So, uh, so in the company, we, we are not allowed to call uh, the dogs dogs, right? And then we don't even call people uh, dog owners, right? It has to be a dog parent or a pet parent. So that's how it came. Excellent, excellent. Now I'll come to maybe a couple of people, uh, maybe Amrita and Hitesh, you could take these, this question. Uh, there's, a, there's always a risk of consumers accepting something very novel, uh, something very different, which has not been tried, and including maybe Taran also. So any of you or all of you, if you could just throw a little bit of light on what were the steps you took to convince, test, or you know, get customers validate your product and accept it, because there's a certain chasm of trust that you need to cross before they start adopting. So any of you. I'll take that up. So we're going after a very interesting space, right? Uh, one, creating a unique product. And we picked a very unique channel, which is going digital first. Before COVID, the online penetration was hardly 8 to 10%. We said, what, how could we reduce the apprehension in the consumer's mind? We did a couple of things, right? Of course, we knew the core uh, problem statement that we're going after. But we said, let's make footwear feature driven, right? When you buy an electronic product, you look at features. You look at how is it going to help you? How is it going to solve your life, right? How is it going to solve a certain problem? So we said our footwear has about six to seven features that any other footwear doesn't have. We, we're introducing India's first sock-free shoes, right? They don't smell. They can be worn in summer and winter. They're machine washable, very easy to maintain. So we started giving people more reasons to buy and try the product. And the second thing that we did was, of course, we were very bullish about the product. So we said, this is a no questions asked product, right? If you don't like it, you don't love it, you don't like it for any reason, right? Post a month, two months, we'll take it back, no questions asked. So people saw that, that a brand which is new is, is able to put it self out there, right? And, and give you uh, the kind of trust and, and then build, build on from there. So that kind of helped to us, right? So um, adding, to, adding to Tarun's point, I think uh, building uh, trust uh, in a brand and in a product comes from actually, um, so like Tarun said, comfort was what he was, he was going after. And for me, convenience was what I was, my product was going after. So um, I, I believe customers are always looking for the new thing. They're always looking for something new. So bringing something absolutely unique in the market was actually, uh, building something unique is actually the easier part. Um, so it was, the trial was easy. And uh, getting loyalty and uh, repeat mostly came from um, a lot of customer engagement that we did. We kept uh, communicating with our customers online through social media. And social media, this whole D2C trend has really helped in that sense that feedback is so soon. And we're able to, we're able to cater to that feedback very easily. So, you know, responding to the customer feedback quickly helped build trust. Um, connecting with the customers directly help build trust and actually um, solving the problem. The, again, um, this was not, I'm in a category which is very utility based. So for me, I did not want to be a pretty diaper. I wanted to actually, I, for, 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 a, for a brand like ours to be successful, we actually had to solve the problem. And we focused on that and we kept improving the product um, and getting it to a certain price point and uh, uh, a certain easy to understand concept that that gain uh, that gave mothers the confidence in uh, in us and get got them to come back uh, so taking a cue from what uh, taran said apprehensions and everybody know when you are dealing in a food product apprehensions are more stronger you know like uh, getting people switch to say for example camel milk it, means even people over here are, you know, a little uncomfortable while hearing this. But the thing is that it is actually the product needs to be solid. 
Okay. So with camel milk, it is actually helping a certain set of people. So if I talk about the medicinal values, so it is very good for autistic kids. It's good for diabetes. We recently came to know that it's, uh, you know, very good for height growth, for growing kids. So once that thing is established, then it all uh, comes down to creating awareness, educating people how uh, this is going to help you and why we are uh, doing what we are doing. Uh, and, uh, you know, getting the pure product, good service and those kind of things, that comes uh, second. Main is that product should uh, solve. It's just that your product is niche. It doesn't mean that you will have a business out of it. It has to solve a certain problem. So I'll open it up now for anybody. And uh, what I'm interested really, I, I completely get that, you know, the product has to be solid, the prop has to be there, it can be communicated through different channels. But any interesting initiative that you've done, you know, which is like first in the segment or something really innovative that you've tried with consumers for them to build that trust and use it because uh, some of these new products, if you just give it to me, I would think twice before using it, you know, how, however, you know, advanced I may be and, and, and I look urban here, right? So any interesting, very out of the world killer use case or, you know, uh, example that you have to share for the audience? Anybody? So, as we're in the apparel space, I think fit is the most important aspect and that was the problem we were solving. So we have a fit guaranteed policy at the PAN project. Um, whether it's free alterations, whether it's making sure that there's like a reverse and a very convenient pickup, all brands out there are trying to create multiple fits and create like multiple SKUs. We actually simplify that and say we have few choices, but we'll make sure that we get your fit right. And that's where the personalization really comes in. So customer care is really important and it's like an integrated sort of like approach, but fit guaranteed is something that we believe in is the future because that addresses multiple problems, whether it's your inventory problem or your uh, problem of comfort. If you're not, if you're not got the right fit, you're not going to be comfortable. So, yeah. And from that, maybe I'll come to both, both of you who are in the apparel space. And, uh, you know, fast fashion has been there for many years. Many brands are there. You're trying to create uh, new designs targeted towards the youth. Uh, how, do you, how do you, again, differentiate? How do you sustain it over a long time? So, okay, cool. so I think... Uh, what we uh, initially thought of was that uh, the whole idea was if we have to bring down the price point, which we figured is one of the main deterrents why people from tier two to tier six places are not buying. Uh, we are also in UAE and um, all, all of our customers are expats, people from India, Pakistan, Cambodia, Vietnam. Um, so the price point is a segment that we were targeting. We are, our average ticket size is only 460 rupees compared to a marketplace which is at 1,800, 1,600 during end of season sale. So one fourth, even when Sheen was banned in India, Sheen probably is our global competitor. Uh, we are one third or one fourth of Sheen uh, everywhere we plan to go. Uh, so, so price point is definitely something that uh, we, we wanted to play on. And how do we get the price point low? By solving some of the business problems, right? So uh, fabric wastage, uh, industry standard is 15%, we are at 0.4%. Uh, we have our own patented production and demand technology. We got the completion of patent filing last two weeks back. Um, then the uh, unused inventory, right? The 25% unsold inventory. In our case, it's zero. We don't have any unsold inventory. Whatever comes back gets disassembled and then goes back into the, our production and demand tech, gets reused for something else. Um, RTO, uh, we are at less than 7% RTO. Our AI backend actually manages RTO really well. We are also in words with a couple of other partners to help it bring down even further. Uh, so all of these things have actually helped us, you know, put down the cost and remain completely nimble in terms of zero warehouse, zero inventory. We don't even have tailors. We have an Uberized supply of tailors. Uh, we don't hire tailors. We have a Uber partner kind of an app for Taylor. They take the pre-cut material. They don't have to worry about cutting and quality and anything. Everything is provided by us. It's like a DIY. Take few pieces, stitch them along the line, and bring it back. That's all that they have to do. So we have around 320 tailors in India, around 57 tailors in UAE. We are growing that network, of course. We are taking help from the government also. Uh, but, but all of these actually passes on to the customer in terms of price point, in terms of choice. 
because we don't have an inventory, we can upload designs every day. We upload more than 1,000 designs every day, sorry, every week. So we don't follow a seasonal pattern. We don't have spring, summer, autumn, winter. Customers can come back and tell us that, I like this pan, can you add something more to this and, and create a new product? We can do that. And we can customize the size also, like, like he mentioned, right? So we have an option where uh, customers can say, I like your, I want your medium size, but my bus size is larger, two inches larger. Can you do that? We can do that because we just have to change one pattern block. Um, so yeah, the focus has always been to cater to that audience who are less targeted. 80% of our orders come from tier two to tier six places as opposed to other brands, and I think that is one of the success signals that we have so far. I think for us, uh, right, uh, four of us who started this company, none of us come from fashion background. So uh, uh, all of us had different field when we came together. Uh, and uh, one thing that really helped Campus Sutra reach wherever we have is, you know, challenging status quo. I think fashion is a very legacy industry, right? Uh, you go and uh, meet anyone in the ecosystem, they will say, yeah, this is if this shirt is made in a month, it takes 30 days. Or if there are two seasons, it takes two seasons. So, you know, uh, with the likes of even Arvind, Madhura, a lot of these guys, right? There's a standard set practices that a lot of these legacy players, even international brands follow. So, for us, it was about kind of, you know, questioning each and every aspect of this industry. Uh, right from... Uh, the time when the yarn is procured to the final delivery, right? And uh, uh, while a lot of ecosystem has been built now, when we came into the market, uh, everything was just getting built, right? There was no tech. Uh, the entire uh, ecosystem or the entire e-commerce was kind of still evolving. Uh, now, I'm sure you would have seen a lot of D2C brand. If you go to a manufacturer, you get a much warmer reception. If you go, if, when we went to... Uh, factory and we would say ki, you know hum online karenge ye wo to uh, they would laugh at us ki hum 20000 piece mehne ka banate uh, daily ka banate hain uh, you want 100 pieces or 200 pieces you're not interested uh, the only uh, solace would be you know few people would say ki just before you last year mukesh mansal was sitting here right so that was that was the only good thing about interacting with lot of these uh, uh, supply chain guys but so for us it was about challenging and kind of redoing the entire uh, supply chain of, uh, of fashion. So we actually have made a process which is 72, there are 72 points which are different from how uh, Arvind or a Madura would go about, you know, uh, ma making arrow. So uh, while uh, some might be very small or some might be big, we have redesigned the entire supply chain and made it, uh, made it attuned for uh, what it is, right? And the second challenge in fashion is, uh, it's very easy to build a 10 crore brand in fashion actually. Right. If you get few things right, building a 10 crore brand is the easiest thing compared to a lot of other categories. So, you know, she was talking about diapers and all that. So, a lot of these categories, getting to 10 crores is very difficult. Maybe going from 10 to 200 or 300 is easier because, uh, you know, uh, the supply chain is not that complicated. A lot of things are, uh, you know, kind of start working for you once you have reached a certain scale. In fashion, it is the other way around. Reaching 10 crore, you get few things right, you, you're able to reach. But how do you reach 300, 400, 1000 crores, right? Even a brand like Levi's, after being in India for so long, is only a 1,200 crore brand, right? So if, if you have to create a two, 3,000 crore brand, right, if that is the vision, then there are a lot of changes that you need to make in your entire approach of how you are kind of, you know, looking at the business. And I think that's what Campus Sutra has done, where we don't take anything on face value. If any of my associate comes and tells me, you know, let's do this and, uh, you know, this is how the industry practices, you know, we say, okay, we'll not do it. You know, uh, one ground rule that we follow, that any thing that industry does, we won't do it. You know, we do things from common sense, just go and see whether it makes sense at a very commonsensical level and then redesign and rebuild on it and then, then go ahead and do stuff. So I think that's something that has helped us. Thanks. I'll come to Radhita. I'll come to... Uh... Actually, I just wanted to add to your point, uh, your question of what is, the one, what, what is that one thing edgy? So, um, so for, for us, um, we were doing performance marketing, we were acquiring customers, they were all, and all of that, like everybody does. But the one time that we got the most traffic on our website was when we stopped talking about diapers. So we started uh, um, a blogging site. It was called Scary Mommy. It's called scarymommy.com. And we got about 50 moms uh, online who, and we, we didn't talk about diapers at all. We built a community of like-minded moms who talked about healthy parenting. And it went back to, you know, choices. 
And that was the easier way of identifying our uh, audience. I mean, I was not out there to sell to every mom. I was out there to sell to almost myself. You know, somebody who was looking for that option that was in between. And so that was something we did that really worked for us. We, that community where we put out uh, sort of user-generated content, talking about, you know, the larger picture of healthy parenting, not talking about diapers at all. That helped us get most traffic. Just something different. Thanks. So I'll come to, uh, uh, you know, on the left side, left side of Amrita and uh, uh, Aradhita. So between both of you, uh, how do you see, you know, continuation of this innovation over a longer period? So, you know, you've created something, it's working for a segment, and maybe it's very, you know, it has got to be niche. Uh, these kind of, you know, creations. How do you sustain it over a longer period so that, you know, you grow and you expand to larger segments? So, I would say innovation here would be constantly answering your customers' needs and requirements. So, for us, we started out as, um, you know, masala chai mixes. Um, we realized also that almost no brands in India are doing um, iced teas in sachets, they're doing maybe a bulk pack where you can make a jug of iced tea. But what if I just want, you know, one glass of iced tea on a hot summer day? And what if I don't want that boring, uh, you know, same old lemon flavored iced tea, which is all over the Indian markets? So that is what we did and we launched iced teas and we did, we did fun flavors like Kashmiri green apple. We did, um, we did a Mahabaleshwar mixed berry flavor. We did a Pondicherry peach and passion fruit flavor. So um, this, was, this was directly in response to what we thought our customers wanted. Another thing that we did was uh, we realized that a lot of people were buying our teas for um, their offices. So they were buying maybe like 20 boxes, 30 boxes at one go. So obviously like the next, the next thing that we thought would be, uh, would be a good response to uh, these people was to launch office or corporate packs, where it was like bulk packs of between you know 200 to 500 sachets, along with the cups, disposable cups, and disposable you know stirrers. And this whole thing went as a bulk pack, which was obviously a subscription sort of model, and goes to the uh, offices in the first week of uh, every month. So. I mean, I feel that for any, any brand, like, and for all of us, all of us sitting here, um, innovation is pretty much answering the customer's needs. And the minute we stop doing that, then it's, um, it's trouble for the brand. I'll come to you, if you can just add. Yes. So, uh, so largely your question is around, uh, how do you? How do you continue to innovate? Because you've yeah. found something, but how do you sustain it? So, uh, so for us, so our vision itself contains innovation uh, as its core. It means we don't do normal products. We and that is very much embedded in the team itself. That if you're creating one product, it has to be unique in the market. It has to be patentable. Is what I uh, the definition that we provide in in house. And it is very difficult to uh, scale a creativity based process uh, it is very difficult to create uh, scale creativity because creativity does not have any algorithm you cannot uh, build it in your team to be creative because creativity itself is unbounded means you cannot uh, define creativity so uh, for 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 that we have uh, devised a certain uh, process although any any process around creativity is not foolproof but as much as we could, and that keeps evolving every time. So we've created that process where uh, everybody is uh, forced to exercise their creative nerves and uh, develop uh, that kind of sense where they can create innovations. And that is a quite a long process. We have inculcated that process in the team so that they continue to be working and thinking out of the box in order to create new products, new innovations, things that people haven't seen. Rather, uh, it has been very much inculcated in my team itself that don't ask the customer what they want. It has been a very famous saying now, but it is very much true that customer does not know what they want unless you, obviously, as Steve Jobs said, unless you give it to them. So, 
uh, we don't do user fee user surveys or feedbacks. We don't ask the user uh, what do you, what do you want. Uh, we only do f uh, feedbacks from the user uh, when we present a product to the user, and the, we ask the user for a feedback. So one of the first processes where first steps of the process where uh, we even start thinking of a product is observation. And observation is very key. You don't ask the user anything, but you observe the user, how the user is using a particular set of product, a, a certain category in which we want to go into. So you observe the user, how the user is observing, uh, uh, using the product, and just focus yourself on the usage of the product and how, how the user itself needs to be uh, woven around the usage. Uh, because there, there are two, uh, two, two facets to this. And the one is user-based product design, and the other is usage-based product design. Usage is, uh, for example, a pen. I, you can even use a refill to write, right? Inside the pen, there is a refill. You can also use the refill to write. But uh, once you create a pen, then you consider the user also that need, needs to be comfortable for the finger grip and uh, left and right hand both and all of those things combined. So that's where the entire user comes in in the product design. So uh, from observation, we get to know that what the user actually uh, intends to do with the product. And that intention is the core of uh, core essence which we carry forward in our process. We don't uh, base ourselves in the existing products in the market and do some certain improvements, do some color combinations and all of those th stuff to make it differentiated. So that's primarily how it goes. It's, it goes much, much deeper uh, than that, but yes. Thanks. So with the time left, I'll open for a couple of questions uh, from the audience. If you could hand over the mic to anybody who has uh, any question. This is a very diverse panel, uh, very interesting businesses. Hi. My, am I audible? OK, hi. My name is Akanksha. I am in the process of setting up my own uh, business. So you can call me a wannabe entrepreneur. I have a question for this panel where, and this is where I'm kind of stuck at right now, right? So if you could go back to whenever you started, when you're building the product and you're trying to come up with something that is extremely high quality, but you're also trying to balance it out with getting the product out quickly, balancing it with cost. At, so what is the decision-making point for you, for you know, all of you uh, here? So I, I think I would like to answer this thing. So in the terms of pricing, so our milk powder is super expensive. So whenever you are building anything niche, so before starting it, so there are a couple of things which you should consider. First thing is that, you know, you do your own uh, research kind of thing. So in our case, there are research papers available. There are doctors, scientists whom I can talk to about the credibility of the product. Then there, there are, uh, you know, groups or uh, influencers who are already talking about not the exact same product, but, uh, you know, the TG which will be using your product. They are talking about uh, it already. So you can uh, start uh, with that also. And then thirdly, the most important thing is community. You know, community will help you sell much better and much faster, irrespective of the price. I just want to add over there, you need to start with your minimum viable product. Stop wasting time and get your product to market as early as you can in whichever form. And then you'll answer a lot more questions on everything from your pricing to everything, but until you find your product market fit, find your minimum viable product. I'll just add a bit. So, uh, so when, uh, when we launched this uh, doxy right, there was uh, this very interesting thing that came. We were not only the costly street in India, right? We were the costly street in the UK market as well. So, uh, so what I realized is, uh, you know, when you put out upfront that, okay, it is extremely high quality, you are costly, right? I think you should just be vocal about it. And then defend in a way where, why is that product so costly, right? And, uh, you know, we started focusing on uh, the long-lasting uh, part of our uh, dog treat. We were obviously, like, the costliest in the market. But when a pet parent uh, takes it and gives it to a dog, the dog would eat, uh, yeah, finish one of our bar in average of about 20 minutes to two days. 
right? And any competition product which is close to about like 30% or 50% less than us, the dogs would finish within seconds, right? And when we started putting this message out, obviously we used a lot of veterinary doctors to support and all this. Then ultimately, uh, you know, customers uh, themselves realized that this is not a costly product, right? But it just you just have to pay more. So on that minimum viable product thing, I just want to add a little bit that minimum viable product doesn't mean half baked product. So it has to be uh, it has to fulfill the minimum use of the uh, uh, minimum needs of the user. So that's what a minimum viable product. It gets confused a lot with half baked products. If you selling a shampoo, just launch whatever flavors are all readily available, and we'll see how the user takes it up, and then we'll improve it further. But the thing with de it works for the tech. If you're launching a tech business, you do a minimum viable product, you launch a very basic website. Flipkart was also a very basic website. If you see the first version of Flipkart, it was very basic. It works for tech, but for D2C, uh, if you do a half-baked product as your first uh, launch, your brand would be finished uh, if, if the user doesn't like it or gives, gives you one-star reviews or uh, just talks about it a lot on social media. So it has to at least not annoy the user. That, that should be the basic definition of what the minimum viable product should be. Shouldn't be a half-baked product, is what I would like, want to add. Thanks. We are slightly over time. Uh, if there's one quick question and one response, we can do it. Otherwise, we'll close it. OK. OK, the answer is there. So thanks a lot, panel. Thanks, uh, you know, thanks to the entire audience for listening in. Uh, please connect with the panel, you know, as you meet them offline, outside.